Hello and welcome. You're watching our special program, Democracies of the World. Our show on Sansa TV, where we take you through the latest happenings from Parliament across the globe. In today's edition, we will talk about political crisis in Libya and Iraq, after Baghdad saw its worst fighting for years this week. In the next half an hour, we'll also talk about what a new Chilean constitution would mean, and much more. I'm your host, Bhavna Nair. Beginning with our top story from Iraq. Two months after the unprecedented Sri Lankan political turmoil, wherein thousands of protesters stormed the presidential palace in Colombo, similar sights were visible in Baghdad city in Iraq. According to multiple media reports, at least 30 people were killed and over 300 injured as the security officials fired gunshots and mortars to control the enraged demonstrators. Iraq is in a political deadlock since legislative elections in October last year. It has left the country without a government, president or a prime minister. Take a look at this report. Hundreds of protesters stormed the presidential palace and other government palaces in Iraq on August 29th after an influential Shiite cleric declared that he is leaving politics. What seemed to be a redone of the Sri Lanka crisis, protesters in Baghdad stormed the Green Zone, an area where ministries and embassies are situated. Photos and videos were doing rounds on the internet wherein protesters were seen taking a dip in the swimming pool inside the presidential palace. The violence began after Iraq's influential Shiite Muslim cleric, Muqtada al-Sadr, announced to quit politics. Al-Sadr's announcement followed months of deadlock over the formation of a new government. His bloc won most seats in parliament last October. But he has refused to negotiate with Iran-backed Shia groups to form a government. His refusal to negotiate with his Iran-backed Shiite rivals plunged Iraq into an unprecedented political vacuum now in its 10th month. Muqtada al-Sadr 48 has millions of followers and is seen by many as a figurehead against endemic corruption, poverty and high unemployment which plagues ordinary Iraqis. Al-Sadr, an Iraqi Shia scholar and founder of the most powerful political faction in the country, gained prominence after the fall of former dictator Saddam Hussein. The cleric has exercised a lot of control over the political scenario of the country. And in 2003, his followers and the affiliated militia resisted the US troops following the invasion. Iraq has not seen a stable government in 10 years. Iraq has suffered instability and seen the growth of powerful armed groups since 2003 when dictator Saddam Hussein was overthrown by a US-led invasion. The country is rich in oil but many Iraqis suffer from high unemployment, corruption and lack of basic services with successive governments held to blame. Iraq's Shia Arab majority became politically powerful after 2003 breeding resentment among Iraq's Sunni Arabs and other minority communities. Meanwhile, deadly clashes broke out in Libya's capital Tripoli on Sunday between militias backed by its two rival administrations, portending a return to violence amid a long political stalemate over who should govern the North African country. At least 32 people were killed and over 159 wounded in the violence. Following deadly the clashes, Prime Minister of the Tripoli-based government, Abdul Hamid Biba, stressed the need for elections. So is there a way out of the chaos? Or is Libya on the brink of another civil war? Here are the details. After two years of relative peace, fighting has returned to the Libyan capital. Dozens of people were killed in street battles between rival militias in central Tripoli. Footage circulated online showed houses, government facilities and vehicles apparently damaged from the fighting. Other footage showed militia forces deploying and heavy fire being exchanged across the night sky. 
Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabeba's government, which is based in Tripoli, claimed that the clashes broke out when one militia fired at another. Residents fear the fighting that capped a month-long political deadlock could explode into a wider war and a return to the peak of Libya's long-running conflict. Tensions have simmered since Pati Bashaga was appointed Prime Minister in February by the Eastern Parliament based in Tobruk with Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabeba, the head of the UN-recognized Government of National Unity, refusing to cede power. Libya has plunged into chaos since a NATO-backed uprising toppled and killed long-time dictator Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The oil-rich country has for years been split between rival administrations, each divided between those who support the United Nations recognized government in Tripoli and those who back a rival parliament based in the eastern city of Tobruk. The current stalemate has reportedly grown out of the failure to hold elections in December and Dabeba's refusal to step down. In 2014, another parallel group was formed when the same year the battle for Tripoli began and later acknowledged Khalifa Haftar as the leader. Later, in 2019, the UN-backed agreement led to an internationally recognized government, but Eastern forces or Haftar's forces rejected it and attacked the capital. On the contrary, to support the Tripoli government, Western groups banded together and were able to attack in 2020 with the help of Turkey leading to ceasefires. The UN later made another peace agreement. Prime Minister Abdul Hamid al-Dadeba was assigned to oversee the elections in 2021. As there were no agreements on election rules, the process broke down. Eastern Libya deemed Dadeba's administration and appointed a new head, Fatih Bashaga. The former leader refused to transfer powers. The Western forces saw Bashaga as a chance of victory and united with Haftar's Eastern Alliance. After being appointed, Bashaga was blocked by pro dadeba forces while entering Tripoli. Reports say that in the recent couple of weeks, there's been a definite military build-up around Tripoli, with forces affiliated with Fatih Bashaga gathering and mobilizing on the outskirts of Tripoli. Bashaga's attempt on Saturday to take over Tripoli was his second such attempt since May. Last month, at least 13 people were killed in militia fighting. Bashaga attempted to install his government in Tripoli, triggering clashes that ended with his withdrawal from the city. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. Moving on, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Haiti's capital Port-au-Prince on Monday to demand the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. It is the second such protest this month. Last week, thousands of people marched in several cities of the country to call for the ousting of the Prime Minister. Protesters blamed the Prime Minister for the high cost of living and the widespread violence. Violence and kidnappings have surged in the capital and nearby areas in recent months, with warring gangs killing hundreds of civilians in their fight over territory. They have grown more powerful since last year's assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. Poverty also has been deepened, with inflation reaching 29%. In the special election for Alaska's only United States House seat, Democrat Mary Peltola defeated Republican Sarah Pellin. Peltola has become the first woman, an Alaska native, to hold the seat, and her victory is being deemed as a boon for Democrats. The 49-year-old is Yupik and will serve the remaining months of the late Republican U.S. Representative Don Young's term, who held the seat for 49 years before his death in March. News now from Angola, where President João Lourenço has secured another five-year term after winning the most competitive election in the country's democratic history. The MPLA under President João Lourenço took 51.2% in last week's election. Its closest rival, UNITA, has its best ever result with 44%. General elections were held in Angola on 24 August 2022 to elect the President and National Assembly. Angola
Kerala's long dominant party, MPLA, was declared the winner of a closely fought election, extending its decades long rule and giving President Jao Lorenzo a second term. Official results announced by the National Electoral Commission on Monday reported the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola won 51.17% of the ballots against 43.95% for the main challenger, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. The MPLA in power for nearly five decades has faced criticism over high levels of poverty and unemployment. However, its share of the vote was down from the 61% it gained in the previous election in 2017, while UNITA's share is sharply up from 27%. Lorenzo described the result as a vote of confidence that gave the party the responsibility to promote dialogue and consultation. The MPLA has ruled Angola since the country gained independence from Portugal in 1975. Lorenzo 68, who has governed Angola since 2017, claimed to have built a new Angola, but during election campaigning, Costa Junior 60 blamed the MPLA's grip on power for many of the country's problems, including poverty, inflation and corruption. Angola is the second biggest oil producer in Africa and emerged from the wreckage of a 27-year civil war to become one of the continent's major economic players. But the country's vast oil wealth does not trickle down of many of its impoverished citizens. Lorenzo was the hand-picked successor to former President Jose Irado dos Santos, who ruled the country for 38 years. Dos Santos himself died last month in Spain at the age of 79. A state funeral was held for him in Angola on Sunday. And now news coming in from Brazil. Brazil's main presidential candidates took their gloves off on Sunday and laid into each other in the first presidential debate for the October general election with accusations of corruption and threats to democracy. Our next report gives you all the details. Right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro and left-wing former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva on Sunday took part in the country's first presidential debate just weeks before millions of Brazilians go to the polls. The televised event, which included six of the country's 12 presidential candidates, saw Bolsonaro portray Lula as a corrupt former politician seeking to regain power. While Lula, who was president from 2003 to 2010, accused his right-wing opponent of driving the country's economic progress into the ground. Incumbent far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, who has been heavily criticized for his handling of the COVID-19 crisis and attacks on Brazil's voting system, is running against former President Lula da Silva, who left office with record popularity but was convicted of bribery in 2017. Opinion polls suggest Lula is ahead in the election race. But the gap between the two candidates seems to be narrowing. The debate was watched by millions of voters, but most analysts say unlikely to have much effect on the final vote tally for either of the main candidates. Lula currently leads Bolsonaro 47% to 32%. The first round of the election will be held on 2nd October with the second round scheduled for 30th October if none of the candidates get 50% of the vote. Chile is about to vote on one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. On September 4, Chilean will vote on whether to adopt a new proposed constitution, one that was originally conceived to fix the country's stark inequality. More than 15 million Chileans are eligible to go to the polls. The country's current constitution was written during Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship and despite many amendments, most Chileans say it lacks legitimacy and is too free market oriented. Protest and social upheaval in 2024's then President Sebastian Piñera to call a referendum on creating a new constitution, the final draft of which was submitted to Piñera's successor leftist Gabriel Boric this year. But although 78% of Chilean voters supported the idea of constitutional change back in October 2020 entry referendum, today they appear divided on the draft proposed.
stepping into a very short break here. After the break, we will decode the legacy of Soviet Union's last leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. There's much more on the other side. You stay tuned to Sunset TV. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back after the break. You're watching our special program, Democracies of the World. Our next story is on Mikhail Gorbachev, who changed the course of history by triggering the collapse of the Soviet Union and was one of the great figures of the 20th century, has died in Moscow, aged 91. His death was announced on Tuesday by Russian news agencies who said Gorbachev had died at a central hospital in Moscow after a serious and long illness. Gorbachev, in power between 1985 and 1991, helped bring US-Soviet relations out of a deep freeze and was the last surviving Cold War leader. His life was one of the most influential of his times and his reforms as Soviet leader transformed his country and allowed Eastern Europe to free itself from Soviet rule. The changes he set in motion saw him lionized in the West he won for Nobel Prize in 1990 but also on him the scorn of many Russians who lamented the end of their country's role as a global superpower. Thailand's constitutional court surprised the nation last week by suspending Prime Minister Prayuth Chanocha, a former army chief who first took power in a 2014 coup and stayed on following an election five years later. The court, whose members were largely picked by a military-appointed Senate, took the action while it deliberates on whether Prayuth exceeded an eight-year term limit added into the post-coup constitution. Here's a report. Thailand's Prime Minister Prayut Chanocha has temporarily stepped aside as the country's leader. The court suspended Prayut while it considers a petition that he has reached an eight-year term limit set for Prime Ministers in the 2017 constitution. The decision taken by Thailand's constitutional court was a blow to the former army chief who took over the role of Prime Minister after a military coup in 2014 before winning a controversial general election in 2019. In the meantime, he ordered the kingdom's constitution to be rewritten, banning the Prime Minister from serving more than eight years in office. Earlier this week, the court accepted a petition signed by 172 opposition lawmakers that claims Prayuth's rule started in 2014 when he took power in the coup. The court will also likely consider if his term officially began in 2017 when the constitution was rewritten or even 2019 after the election. The court has given Prayuth 15 days to respond to his suspension. But it did not set a timeline to issue a ruling on the petition itself. Meanwhile, Deputy Prime Minister Pravit Wongsuwan will be the interim leader while the court mulls over its final verdict. Pravit himself is former army chief and a long-time supporter of the Thai monarchy. Fresh elections are due by May next year under the constitution, but the sitting Prime Minister still has the power to call early elections by dissolving the elected House of Representatives. In that case, an election would be held within 60 days after a House dissolution. Prayut's rule as a military coup leader turned Prime Minister has been marred with growing authoritarianism and widening inequality. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. And now another important story in democracies of the world coming in from South Korea. Firebrand lawmaker E. Jem Young was elected to lead South Korea's main opposition party on August 28, months after his narrow presidential defeat to conservative opponent Yoon suk yeol left the Liberals in disarray. E dominant win in the Democratic Party's chairperson's race ends a month-long leadership void for the Liberals who still control a majority in the parliament. It revives his rivalry with Yoon, a relative political novice, who has seen his popularity decline since taking office in May amid a worsening economy, policy mishaps on education and other domestic issues and mishandled cabinet appointments. He, who won nearly 78% of the votes from party members, was announced as the Democrats' new chairperson in a convention held at a gymnastic stadium in the capital, Seoul. South Korea has again recorded the world's lowest fertility rate with the number sinking to a new low. 
The rate in the country's first drop lower than one child per woman in 2018. But figures released by the government has showed the figure had dropped to 0.81, down from 0.84 the previous year and a sixth consecutive death decline. In comparison, the average rate across the world's most advanced economies is 1.6 children. Countries need at least two children per couple, a 2.1 rate, to keep their population at the same size without migration. In 2020, there was widespread alarm in South Korea, where it recorded more deaths than births for the first time. And that's all we have in this edition of our program on Democracies of the World. Connect with us on various social media platforms for all the latest from India and around the world. Thanks for staying in. Stay tuned for more informative programs on Sunset TV. Till then, goodbye.